So I think it's, it's what we're talking about when we're talking about multi-processor systems then is that we're talking about systems where you have multiple CPUs to write your software for. So as, as people said, as we talked about, things like the keyboard have a CPU in them and a lot of the time, something like the Atari or the Amiga or even some of the original PCs to process the keyboard and then just send the data to the computer. But that's not usually uh, a CPU that you're going to program yourself, write part of your application to run on. In the same way, most modern Intel motherboards, the management engine so on, runs on a CPU embedded into the chipset that's running on there. And providing no one hacks it, then you're not going to be running your code on there. It's, it's, it's a CPU, it's doing a task, but it's not one we're going to program with. If it's not the central processing unit, it's an additional processing unit, is it still a CPU? It's the central processing unit of that subsystem. When we talk about a CPU, we're talking about the central processing unit. It's a bit at the heart of the system doing things. So people are so rightly pointing out that we have CPUs, but we're not going to write our software to run on them. You can, and if you look at some weird bits of software, they would sometimes shove things down onto this keyboard CPU. I mean, there's one virus on the Atari ST that did that to stay in memory and things. But we're really talking about the real central processing. Where are we going to write the software that's going to run to do the task we're needing? That's what we're talking about. But there is a class of effectively processing units that you do find in machines that are running part of our software. I mean, the classic example of that would be something like a floating point unit. So these days, our CPUs, whether it's an Intel chip or an ARM chip or something, often have built-in support for doing floating point maps. I'm adding 3.1415926 to some other random number and so on. Um, so they have built-in support for that. But they didn't originally. Um, if you look at the original IBM PC, I've got the XT behind me, so let's take the, the lid off this while we're doing that. So we've got a screwdriver. Built like a tank. Friendly Steve can come back and do some work. So. So we're inside the original PC, and if we look just down here next to the power supply, we will see that if I take this card out, because we don't need a serial port at the moment, we can see what's going on. HD50, serial card, 8-bit ISA bus, so it wasn't called that then. So if we look down here, we'll see we've got on the motherboard an Intel 8088 CPU. That's the main CPU in the original PC. It's what all your PCs are using now derive from, whether it's a Macintosh or Windows machine or whatever, they all have a chip, which pretty much still boots up like the Intel 8088 did from 1983. But if you look next to it, you'll see there's an empty socket with nothing plugged into it. And that was deliberately done there for two reasons. One, when they designed the 8086 or the 8088, they deliberately built it in a way knowing that they might want to add support for what's called a floating point unit or FPU, which is what goes into that spare hole there. And the FPU was a chip that you could buy and put into the PC or put into any machine that had support for an FPU to handle the floating point mathematics. So if you wanted to add floating point numbers together, you could either do it by writing the software to add the two numbers together or you could do it by having a floating point chip inside your computer and the floating point chip would then add the numbers together. And the advantage of that was that you could design the floating point hardware to run a lot faster than you could write the software to do at the same speed. So you could build dedicated hardware to add floating point numbers together in the same way you could build dedicated hardware to add integer numbers together, which is what's inside your CPU. So when they designed the 8088 chip, and well, the 8086 chip, they left support in for this. And so there were some instructions which have a, if the uh, opcode for that instruction started with a specific binary pattern, would allow a floating point unit in the system to take control, reading the values that are accessing from memory. So the CPU would work with the floating point unit to load the values in from memory. And then the floating point unit would go off and do the floating point calculation in parallel at the same time as the CPU kept running doing integer stuff. And so you did get some sort of parallel processing, but it wasn't a general purpose processor this time. It, all it could do was floating point stuff. If it needed to access memory, it was the CPU that started things off. There was support in that. 
to actually do some, to fetch further values and so on using direct memory access. But in general, it was reliant on the CPU to do a lot of the things. So it sort of supported the CPU, but gave you a significant speed boost compared to doing it all in software. The nice thing was is that the CPU, if you ran those instructions, would throw an exception so you could write software, then catch them, implement those instructions in software. But if the, CPU, if the FPU was present, it let the hardware do it in parallel. So you could get the best of both worlds. You could write the software to use floating point maths, don't worry about the floating point unit being there. If it is there, you could then take advantage of it. Now, the reason why the machine sh shipped with an empty socket is because the empty socket probably cost a few cents, a few pennies to, to put in, but the CPU cost about $100, I think, minimum, if not more than that, to put in the machine. So if you were just using something like word processing on the machine, you don't need a floating point unit for most of the stuff you're doing. You, would, you wouldn't bother, but if you're doing something that did heavy number crunching, then you could drop the floating point unit into the machine when it was built, and you'd have one that would work a lot better to do those sort of operations. Now, of course, as the machines developed through the 8186, the 286, the 386, the 486, the software developed, and by the time the 486 was popular, we had sort of fonts being drawn from outline descriptions things, which actually involves doing floating point calculations. And so eventually, the floating point unit got built into the CPUs themselves. So we can have sort of processing units which aren't there as general processing units, but they support the operations that the CPU do. They take some of the operations that run on the CPU in software, and they don't add any new functionality. There's nothing that you can't do without them, but by doing it in hardware, you get a speed boost by doing it. In the case of the floating point unit on the original PC, or you could get the same for the sort of Motorola machines, you could perhaps get a hundred fold increase in the speed it took to do those floating point operations. Everything else ran at the same speed, but for the floating point operations, it would run about 100 times faster, which of course meant if you got a lot of them, your programs ran about 100 times faster. If you weren't using them, you didn't get any benefit at all. Another one which is quite interesting, which you'd find in things like some Atari STs and in most Amigas, is what was called the Blitter chip. And the Blitter chip basically implemented what was called the bit block transfer routine, or bit blit, it was often referred to. And this was developed at Xerox Park in the 70s on the Alto machine, I think it was. And it was basically a generalized algorithm for copying blocks of memory around, particularly in the way that you want to do raster graphics. One of the things that both the Amiga and the Atari had, and the only reason I'm looking at the Atari here is because it had it as a separate chip on the motherboard, which is annoyingly under the network card. Atari developed another chip which implemented the bit block transfer algorithm because the advantage was then that your main CPU wanted to copy a bit of memory, would set up this chip, which just appeared as an IO peripheral, and say to this, copy this bit of memory from this address to this address, combine it with what's already there using this sort of combination, and you could do some very fancy graphics effects. But the advantage was, whereas when you implemented it in software, you had to read the instruction for memory that said load this value from memory, and it loaded it into a register. It would then read the next instruction that says load that value from memory and it would load it into a register. It would then do the combination and write the value back out. This could just have a few hardware counters directly inside it that loaded the value from memory, loaded the next value from memory, combined them, wrote them back out into memory. So it could do it a lot faster. It could run every clock cycle doing some useful work as opposed to some of them having to fetch the instructions that were doing what we needed to be doing. So by offloading it onto a dedicated support chip, again, just like with the FPU, you're not doing anything you can't do with the main CPU, but you're offloading it there, you're having it run slightly faster, and then the CPU can get on with other things, although in this case it had to wait for the blitter chip to finish it, but it was still faster than doing it manually for all but the smallest of operations. The Amiga did the same thing, it had a blitter chip along with a couple of other things which gave it the advantages in terms of graphics. Of course, the problem I had, and which Atari found, is that as your CPU gets faster, you also have to make the blitter chip faster, or your CPU becomes much faster than the blitter chip, so there's no point in having it on there. So the Atari TT, for example, which is a 32 megahertz 68030 as opposed to an 8 megahertz 68000, um, which also had a cache, the 68030 also had a cache um, ran so much faster that the instructions would be in the instruction cache so the CPU could just fetch the data at full speed from memory and wrote, write it back with the combination done without the need for the blitter chip. And so you very quickly, your CPU gets faster, you've got a more general architecture, you can do whatever you need to do there. And so actually the blitter chip became redundant in some of the Ataris pretty soon after it was implemented. Although they did put a faster version 
into the Falcon, which can be useful in certain modes. Acorn, on the other hand, when they built the Archimedes, they're at the, roughly the same sort of time as Commodore Amiga and the Atari ST had the Blitter chips. They said, well, actually, our CPU is so fast that we don't need it. There's no advantage to it. Um, but the same approach was taken with graphics cards in computers that you'd end up with the graphics card having uh, support to do some of the basic 2D operations that Windows was wanting to do and so on. So rather than doing them on the actual CPU, you would hand that control off to the graphics card to do that. Things like copying the memory about perhaps drawing a straight line, which you can very easily implement in hardware. And so you've got this balance between do you, you get your CPU to do this as a general piece of software, which you can change and update easily, or do you hand this over to a dedicated piece of hardware where you can implement it in a way that's faster and so on. So for some things like the um, graphics things, and floating points, they have very much now been taken over by dedicated bits of hardware. Okay, you don't get dedicated bits of 2D hardware anymore, we get GPUs which are effectively general purpose processing units, but they're very much configured and designed in a way that makes them very amenable to doing particularly 3D graphics processing, but also 2D graphics processing as well. And almost all CPUs these days and desktop machines and laptops and so on have a floating point unit built in because we're doing stuff that needs those floating points. So it makes sense in some cases to have hardware to do that. In other cases, it makes more sense to have it in the generalized nature of software. Sort of be responsible for cleaning it yourself. You could be responsible for managing the house and the things, or you could employ someone else to do it on your behalf. So you could employ a cleaner or someone to sort of clean the house rather than you having to do it yourself, as some people might choose to do. And it's the same with the computer.